today is a special episode with some special guest on the show and as we prepare to delve into our conversation on the topic at hand writing and storytelling there is an exciting twist we have a guest alex bennett so let us tickle his brain first alex please get ready for a rapid fire round of random words i'll mention a few and i'd love to hear the first thing that comes to your mind in response without thinking much are you ready for it i'm ready <laughs> excited so it comes my first word curiosity learning invention curiosity <laughs> future right book identity movie boring <laughs> food uh sustenance place home name uh unimportant animal dog the last one is world small <laughs> and your answers were also small as i expected thank you so much for participating in the first rapid fire round so sportively really appreciate it alex and folks welcome to the guiding voice podcast series where we embark on transformative conversations for a better future i'm your host navin samala dedicated to making the world a better place through valuable discussions that add value not only to your life but also to your career and thank you so much for tuning in alex hearty welcome to the guiding voice i'm glad you are here today with me in this virtual studio i appreciate it thank you very much for having me you know it's an honor and a blessing and uh i truly enjoy these sorts of moments and i hope to have a great time absolutely and i'm thrilled to have you as well in fact there will be one surprise awaiting you after this conversation so let me kick off the first question as always i start with the success mantra of my guest so request you to start with your success mantra as well can you share the top 3 things that have contributed to your success so far you know number one i have to say patience you know i always say i'm a very patient person i think working in restaurants being a bartender and that you know i deal with a lot of people and you got to be patient with people you know yeah. um even in little moments you know i'm waiting for you to take the order something like that but it, as a bigger picture thing you know you, sometimes you just got to be patient let, let life work itself out you know it's easy to get caught up in the emotion of a moment but a lot of times you if you become you know if you become a slave to your emotions it can be a problem for you so i've learned to kind of sit back take a breath kind of let it play itself out a little bit and more often than not it works out for my benefit to do that the second thing i'd say is you know you got to be a good li- listener especially again in my business but i say, i think it's overall you know you you want to get to know people you want to be a conversationalist the best the best tool you can have is to listen there's an old saying it's a greek philosopher that it said uh man has two ears but one tongue and so that's because he can listen to twice as much as he speaks and i try to live by that you know if i'm in a kind of if you're sitting in my bar and we're having a conversation i'm going to try to defer to you much more than i'll then I'll try to speak. It doesn't mean I don't speak and I speak a lot. But in the end I think listening is is more important than anything. And then the third thing is you know focus, you know, it's easy to get distracted in life. It's easy to get caught up in minutia and things that doesn't matter and, and sometimes you know and especially again in restaurants, you know, you you could have eight tables going at one time. You got one bad table. If it throws you off, you lose your focus and you got seven or other bad tables. But if You know, you can maintain your focus. That's one little area you got to focus on the rest. You know, you maintain your focus, then one bad table, you got seven good ones. Well, you know, you're still doing a pretty good job. Patience, listening and focus are your success mantra. And that's so yeah. amazing. <laughs> and Alex, you have extensive experience working in the restaurant industry. And can you share some valuable insights into what it takes to manage a successful restaurant or a bar? and also what skills do you believe are essential for individuals in these professions well the first thing i'll tell you is if you want to go into restaurants and bars you got to be a people person you know i say every business is a people business but in a lot of businesses you might only have 5 10 15 customers so to speak in restaurants you know you want to have as many as you possibly can you'll you might see a thousand people in the course of a single week you hope for more actually you know and to do that you got to like people you got to want that has to be your kind of your drive behind it. it has to be your purpose for it any financial advice advisor any accountant any any money person will tell you that the biggest mistake you can make 
is investing in a restaurant to make money. It's probably going to fail. Most restaurants do. But if you go into restaurants with the idea of investing in the people and, and getting to know people, then that kind of gives you your purpose. And if you have your purpose for being there, everything else kind of falls into place. You know, and I, I do have some really good stories that I can tell you about that. You know, one of them, one of them is at one end of the spectrum, the other one's at the other end of the spectrum, but it gives you a good idea of how it kind of works. Because uh, you know, I'm 53 years old, turned 50 in 2020, and that was uh COVID times. Yeah. We just kind of, you know, restaurants have been shut down. I live in outside of Chicago, Illinois. And at the time we've been reopened, but we were all spread out. You know, you can only have so many people in there. It was my 50th birthday party. I'd been working there for 15 years. I knew so many people, you know, and I was letting all my regulars know, hey, I'm turning 50. I'll be working. I'll be working. You know, everybody was like, do you want to take it off? I'm like, why would I take it off? I'm just going to sit at home by myself. I'd rather (laughs) come into work and see all my people, you know. And as it turned out, the place was packed. In fact, we mm. probably had a lot more people there than we should have. And, you know, at the time, and, I, and this is the number one thing, my point to this, is that as human beings, we need to celebrate. We need yep. to get together. We need to gather. We need to congregate. We need to have a reason to have a good time. And so, and I'm working. And I have all these people showing up. And a lot of them kind of knew each other from previous times. And so they're having a great time. And I'm chatting with them. And I was having a great time, too. Don't get me wrong. But, um. And I, before I say even, actually, I floated out of that place because it was such a, like, a, such a good feeling for me mm-hmm. to have so many people show up like that, you know? But, but anyway, as the night goes on, I, I had a special bottle of wine that I brought in to celebrate with everybody. And I cracked it open around 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you know, passed out a toast to everybody. And all of a sudden, man, the entire place broke out and happy birthday. You know, and, I, and I'm 50 and I didn't expect anybody to sing me happy birthday, but it was so loud. It carried through the entire restaurant to where the cooks heard it. The people in the dining room heard it. I started having all these other people wandering in to see what was going on. You know, and it, and again, it was such a good, it was humbling feeling, if that made any sense. Because here all these people are out, and they're, they're out for me. But they're having a great time with each other. And at the end of the night, you know, as they're leaving, they're telling me, you know, and again, they're giving me gifts. And I had a great night, don't get me wrong. But, like, they're telling me, you know. Thank you. I needed this. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. I had to release, you know. And so it kind of tells you, the, you know, they're thanking me for coming in and giving and celebrating my birthday with me. Yeah. And I should be thanking them for mm. what they've done for me. And, and, and again, it was a great night. Restaurant made a lot of money. I made a lot of money. But the purpose of the night was to celebrate with my mm. friends, so to speak, you know. And the other really good story I can tell you about it is... Uh, you know, I, I grew up working in restaurants. Long story short with this, my parents bought a place when I was 16. They ended up selling it to my in-laws when I was 30. Uh, my in-laws became my former in-laws, and that's kind of how I got out of that place. Now, I get along great with my ex. I have nothing <laughs> bad to say about my ex. In fact, I say it's the best thing that happened to me because it forced me to get out of my comfort zone. But anyway, I'm still kind of connected to that restaurant. And there was a regular who was coming in way back when, mm. and he recently, recently passed away. And I was talking to my ex-wife, her name is Don, and she was telling me that they're having the celebration of his life at the restaurant. And he knew a ton of people and his mm. friends knew a ton of people. And the restaurant, the restaurant can accommodate about 130 people. And she was talking to the guy who's hosting it, his name Mike, and she was talking to him. And she, he goes, yeah, we're going to have to cut like half the people from this party because we just there's not enough room. And she had said to him, you know. You don't have to have it here. It wouldn't offend me if you didn't. And he goes, no, you don't understand. On his deathbed, he had said, we have to have the party at Maury's. The Maury's is the name of the place. And, you know, from her perspective, it's like we work there. We And, and we have fun. Don't get me wrong. It's a fun job. But it's still a job. And we don't understand how it affects other people that come in there. And for him... It was a place where he had his best memories. It kind of gave him an identity. Everybody knew him there. So he had to have his celebration there, regardless of if everybody could come or not, because that was his place. And again, that's what I say. The purpose of getting in in the restaurants is to have those moments. Other restaurant people will listen to these stories, and that's what they're searching for. More than the investment, more than the money. It's, it's having these moments that gives you purpose, that, that lets you know that your job is, is gratifying and how much you really do affect other people. 
so people 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 and interacting with people is a significant part of the restaurant and it's, bar industry right so can you share some of the most important lessons you have learned through your interactions with customers and colleagues and particularly in the context of defining success in life and also finding purpose because you said don't follow money or don't chase money but find the passion when you are setting up your own restaurant or your own business so well, more about it. <laughs> you yeah. know and that's what i would say a lot of people that i know that have set up businesses you know they they're very successful at it um they would tell me that you know they knew the industry you know some of them they got into it at 18 or 19 one of my best regulars he got into logistics shipping stuff you know trucking stuff like that and he was in the military got out of the military didn't really know what to do with his life ended up with a job as a truck driver and in that in that context he moved up in the company and then next thing you know he's in charge of the, of the shipping and from there he went to open up his own distribution warehouse and his own company and he had said to me you know it was my identity it was what i knew it was what i what i knew i was good at and i could pursue and i guess that would be the lesson i would share with people you know everybody says if you like something you know you got to follow it you know you won't work a day in your life well i love baseball and i love pitching but i can't throw a fastball for the life of me so you know that's not necessarily the best advice but if you're good at something and you know what you're good at then you you follow that you know that'll give you confidence and that'll make it fun and that and that'll also you know make it so that your work doesn't seem like work so much and you'll be successful at it cuz you're good at it if you're good mm. at something you're going to be successful at it and i guess that's that would be the lesson that i would pass on to people more than anything mm awesome and now let's uh, move to the core of today's conversation you have been working in the in the, in the restaurant industry for quite a long time and then became an author so many of our listeners are also aspiring or writers or authors so could you share your personal experiences with the writing process including any challenges you faced and how did you overcome them what techniques or strategies have you find helpful for tackling the writer's block which many encounter well that's a great question i actually get asked that a lot now at one point when so when i left the restaurant that my parents opened and sold to my in-laws i didn't know what i was going to do with myself it's the time everybody was saying you know we need male teachers we need male teachers and so i went back to school i got my master's degree in education i got certified to teach english and uh the problem was that it was 2010 the housing market collapsed and i couldn't find a job And so my boss at the time was like, "Hey man, you're good at this. I'll give you full-time hours. You can keep part here." And and so that's kind of when I fell into the spot. Now, to answer your question, I had learned how to teach people how to write. And I had mm. uh, grown up, I was always reading and I always wanted to write something. And so at that point I thought to myself, "Well, I can apply the lessons that I can teach other people to myself mm. and then I can start doing my own thing." And and you know and i i read a lot about writing i'm an english geek from you know from the get go i love seeing the symbolism and everything i love to read and i love to write and i love to put figure of language and stuff and whatever else and so in doing all this and studying all this and for my education you know i have three bits of advice that i give everybody number one comes from hemingway where he said the first draft of every anything is crap you yeah. just want to get your thoughts on paper You just want, you know, you don't worry about spelling, you don't worry about grammar, you don't worry about word choice. You don't worry about being repetitious or anything like that. You're just getting the story out there and then you'll polish it from there. I think the biggest mistake everybody thinks is that they're going to sit down and write the best seller. And no, writing is a process. You're going to sit down and write the rough draft. And then you're going to write another draft. And then you're going to go through it again and again until you look at it and you say to yourself, "All right, this is good. This is time for the next step." Now the next bit of advice I tell everybody is write what you know. You know, mm -hmm. it's so much easier if you got a story, if you're a fireman or if you're in the military or, or if you're, you know, you're in restaurants or you're a podcaster, you have to have stories from your life that you could that would relate to other people. So write those stories. Don't try to create something because you already have the characters in place. You already have the context in place. Yes, you might have to change some things, but in the end you know you know whether it was a sunny day or it was a rainy day 
you know whether or not the person was wearing a blue shirt or a red shirt. Those are the details that you want to put in the stories, and and you you already have them. You don't have to conceptualize them. So it's much easier that way if you write the stuff that you know. And then the third thing um, is you got to treat it like a job, you know. Mm. I, and that's the that, that might be the number one way to come overcome writer's block is that you have your days that you write. And an example I use is that I always close the bar on Thursday nights. So on Thursday days, I'm in front of my computer at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to write until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't care if I write two sentences or 20 pages. I'm okay. going to sit there the entire time. And I'm going to do it on Saturday when I close the bar, and I'm going to do it on Tuesdays, which you know is my, usually my days off from the bar. I'm going to be in front of that computer for a minimum of four to five hours. And, you know, I'm going to let it flow from there. And a lot of times, if I'm struggling on one day, I'll go to mm-hmm. sleep that night. I wake up the next day and all of a sudden, you know, your brain kind of works it out a little bit. Hemingway had also said, you know, you never you never let the well run dry. So, you know, you want to stop at a point to where you still got something in your head so you can pick up the next day. And, and, and your brain works on that stuff overnight. And so when you get back at it, all of a sudden, the problems that you couldn't overcome, you see it from a different perspective. I can relate to certain aspects of my own writing journey as well. So me and my co-author, we dedicate certain amount of time and also we have a catch-up on a weekly basis, irrespective of whether we make progress or not. We make sure that we are sticking to that. That actually fuels our passion in terms of taking it forward. And I can resonate with uh, what you have mentioned. Now, let's talk about your book. I would love to hear more about it. So please provide a brief overview of what you have conveyed and what are the key messages or the insights it offers to the readers. Okay, so <clears throat> I actually play with the history of whiskey. I say it's bourbon and pirates with a little Shakespearean flow there. Now, whiskey has been around for probably about 800 years in Britain, and whiskey's grain alcohol. Barley's the native grain to Britain, and that's why the Scots and the Irish started making whiskey out of barley way back when. Now, during age of exploration, everywhere they went, they would find the native grain, and they'd start making whiskey out of it. So when they get to America, corn's native to America, they start making whiskey out of corn, and that was Mm -hmm. the first step in making bourbon. Mm. The second step came about when, at the time, everything was shipped in wooden barrels, but that was just so one man could roll it. And nothing to do with the aging process because they didn't age it because you couldn't trust the water. So if you add some alcohol to it, now it's going to be safe to drink and, you know, you could consume it. So if you were making a batch of whiskey and you had a barrel made out of pine, you'd fill that up and you'd send it on its way. You can imagine how it might affect the taste, but they just sort of dealt with it because it wasn't going to be in there that long anyway. But then they get to America. They start making barrels out of white American oak. And they'd fill those up and they'd send them on the way and they'd get to where they were going. And everybody's like, wow, this is great. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. So they associated it to, and that was the second step in making bourbon. And then the third step came about when you had your white American oak barrel, but it was filled with pickles or herring or crabs. You could imagine how that might affect the taste. So they started charring out the inside to get rid of the lingering flavors and odors and mm. realized, wow, this is great. We're on to something now. And so that's how bourbon was born. Now, it's a very murky history. They say it's yeah. 1785, but by 1785, it was a thing. You'd come up with the corn. I came up with the barrel. Somebody else came up with charring it out. We kind of compared notes. So as, so as a result, I can play with it. And I go back to 1743. At the time, it's the last true Scottish rebellion against the English, but it was mm-hmm. a small part, much larger war. The whole world was at war. Um, and our young Scotswoman in America wants to make whiskey, so she's stumbling on that process of making bourbon. And at the same time, there's an Irish pirate. Every time she hears about an English ship that has a barrel of her Okies aboard, she seizes it, she accuses the captain of smuggling, and she executes him. And you know how guys are. The more dangerous something is for us, the more we're going to want it. So as her stories grow, her legend grows, her stories cross the Atlantic, and they reach an English pirate hunter fighting the war. But but at that point, I get into the second, third books. It's actually a trilogy. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. So, so you are a great storyteller. And what advice do you have for aspiring storytellers or individuals looking to become better at telling stories that resonate with people on a fundamental level? Well, you know, when it comes to storytelling, a lot of times the best thing you can do is relate it to the person you're talking to. And, you know, I always say the details, too. The details matter. And, and, and a good example of that is, you know, I had a lady come into the bar one one time and, and she had a son who was like 10 or 11 years old. 
who struggled in school, didn't want nothing to do with school, didn't want nothing to do with reading. He was failing and everything. And, you know, if you can't read, you're going to you're gonna struggle with everything else. And so she had told me it was Easter and she was looking for something to put in his Easter basket. And, and he was a big fan of the, the superhero hero movies. So Spider-Man and Wolverine and all that. And she just happened to see some comic books and she put those comic books in his basket and he saw them. And, and, and that was that like made his those were the gifts that he got that he loved the most. And so he sat down and, and nobody thinks comic books are books. Or nobody thinks that, you know, and in an English person, I look at comic books very differently. They're picture books. They're the yeah. kind of things that we teach. You know, if you're teaching a two year old how to read, you got a word, and you got a picture. Same with comic books. And then her son already could relate to him because he knew the characters. He knew Spider-Man. He knew Wolverine. He knew Dr. Octopus. He knew the Green Goblin. He knew all those people. So he was started getting interested in reading the comic books. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of led him to learn how to read. And then, uh, like, maybe a year later, I had another lady sit at the bar, same situation. And so I tell her that story. And, you know, she could relate to it. And, and it, you know, and I, I never saw her again, so I don't know if she did it. But in the end, you know, that's kind of, I'm telling the story to kind of help her. And, and the providers, you know, help solve a problem. Um, another story that, that I can tell you, you know, sometimes it's just, it's to predict the future a little bit where I had a friend who she grew up in Wisconsin and she was very much an outdoors person. Now she's very beautiful and I would never, never say that she was rugged or anything like that, but she spent a lot of time, her dad was a hunter and she spent a lot of time hunting. And then the first time I got to know her, the first winter came around and she said, oh man, it's going to be a brutal winter. And I said, you know. <laughs> well, we'll see or whatever. And as it turned out, it was a brutal winter. Next winter comes around. She goes, oh, it's not going to be that that bad this year. And I looked at her. I'm like, how do you know this stuff? And, and her dad, like I said, he was a hunter. And he was a big guy, burly guy. He would grow a beard, big, long beard every winter. You know, he's one of those, looked like a lumberjack, always wore flannels, that sort. Anyway, she had told me, well, he's out hunting. And every time he hunts, he gets a deer. He checks the fat layer. And if the fat layer is thick, he knows it's going to be a bad winter. If the fat layer is thin, he knows it's going to be a, a, a mild winter. And so, you know, she tells me that story. Well, in Chicago, you know, we face the winter every year and it's always the conversation that comes up. I wonder what this one's going to be like. So I tell that story to people, you know, and try to relate it to them that way. And and, and again, you know, I'm. We're, you know, we're, we're bonding or whatever, you know, we're communicating about the same thing. But, you know, when you tell stories, you want to put in details. You want to make okay. the stories interesting. So I say he's got a big beard and he always wears flannel. Puts an image in your head. You know, he's a burly guy. Yeah. Looks like a hunter. You know, you think of winter, cold, mild, you know, you want to you think of snow. You put those sorts of images in your head. And that's where, you know, A, you want to relate the story to the person that you're talking to. But B, you want to put in little details that bring it alive in their mind. Fabulous. I'm, I'm loving every bit of this uh, incredible conversation. Now it's time to add some more excitement. So Alex, get ready for a second rapid fire round. I'm going to ask a series of intriguing questions to spice up the episode further. If you're ready, let's dive in right away. Uh, let's do it. <laughs> okay, here comes the first bullet. If you could have any gigantic billboard with anywhere and with anything on it, what would it say? I buy my book. <laughs> you know, I say I'm a living billboard in that respect, and I, I'm going to be selling my book for the rest of my life. Maybe that seems a little selfish or something, but in the end, you know, I, I going back to our previous question, you know, I identify with my book probably yeah. more than anything, even bartending anymore. And if you yeah. sit down in my bar, you're going to hear about my book. And so if I could put a big old billboard up in the sky, it would be the cover of my book with a little bit of a summary and, hey, give it a read or something yeah, like and, that. And and while the billboard is set up, being set up, you'll find the link to Alex's book in the show notes or the episode description. Go grab a copy. That's brilliant. And if they can click on, click on that link, even better. Okay. And, and what's one thing? That you are really bad at, that you wish you were better or good at. I wish I could learn another language. I've tried, and I, you know, I work with, a, I work in restaurants, I work in kitchens, I work with a lot of native Spanish speakers, and and I picked up a little bit here and there. But you know, there's a, there's like a, 
you have to think in the language, and I just can't do it. And I look at anybody that can pick up another language. I don't care what their background is. I say, wow, man, you're smarter than you're smarter than me because I just I just can't like there's a bridge that I just can't cross, and I respect mm. it to a level that you know, God, I wish I could do it. You know, it's it's just it's one of those things that's a drawback for me, without a doubt. Okay, and can you describe yourself in just one word? Authentic. Authentic. What you see is what you get. Oh, super fabulous. And what is your favorite thing about living in the current times, the 21st century? Having done so much of the research I've done, I would say fresh water. You know, people really don't appreciate like what that means for us in terms of, you know, you can go to a sink and you can you can uh, turn on the spigot and take a drink and, and it's safe. And, you know, there's a lot of places in the world that it's still not like that where you're walking a mile every day to fill up two buckets with fresh water that you're bringing back a mile, you know, and you consider that that's the way it was for thousands upon thousands of years. <laughs> like, you know, and, it, and it's not just fresh water. It's that sort of, you know, food to go to a store. We don't have to go out and hunt. We don't have to go out and grow things. You know, we, we those modern, those basic modern conveniences, man, I probably appreciate that more than anything. Mm, good one. <laughs> so, so Alex, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? I'd say probably invisibility. You know, I don't, and, and I suppose <laughs> I, people who want strength or whatever, but like being a fly on the wall and knowing what's really going on, that would be really cool to me. You know, I'm a listener anyway. So, if I could be in a room and nobody knows I'm in that room and listen to what they're saying, whether it's about me or whether it's about work or whether it's about, you know, <laughs> the world, I wouldn't care. I'd want to know exactly what's going on. And I kind of been in that situation anyway, because a lot of times, you know, you got two people talking at the bar and they, they don't they don't appreciate the bartender as a human being. And so you hear him talking about stuff that I'm like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. Or, wow, all right. I wouldn't expect <laughs> that, you know, and. They kind of open up that way. Maybe having a few drinks helps that too. But in the end, visibility. I would love to be invisible. And uh, here comes the last bullet out of the rapid fire. What is one electronic gadget that you'd like to see or invent yourself? You know, that's a good question. I, being on the other side of 50, I've seen a lot of things get invented that I would never even con conceive of when I was younger. But I suppose if there's anything, you know, I get psoriasis and eczema. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's skin issues. And uh, and I handle it through lifestyle and diet. I don't, I don't take the immune suppressors or the steroid creams or anything like that. I don't, hey man, anybody that handles it, however you handle it is great and I respect it. But that's just the way I, I, I chose to do it. One of the best uh, treatments, I guess I'd say, is I went to a doctor, she was a naturopath, and she was able to introduce the frequency of different foods to my body to see how I would react to them. If I react positively, I can eat it. If I react negatively, I can't. And, uh, you know, she tested me for like 400 foods. And I would say of everything I've ever done, that worked the best because I know what I got to stay away from, but I also know what I can eat. And I suppose if there's any, the problem with it is that if there's something that I see at the store or in a restaurant, well, I got to go see her to see if I can get tested to see if I can eat it, you know, where if I, man, if there was a handheld device where I could just do it in that second, and I know right then, man, I would love that. Superb, superb. Then let's uh, flip back to the mainstream. And uh, what will be your advice? As I've seen, you are adaptable to various discussion directions. And what will be the specific message or a piece of wisdom that you'd like to leave our audience with today? You know, keep an open mind. You can learn from everybody. And that is the, you, you know, that is the greatest gift I've got from bartending. You know, I have a very diverse clientele. And so I learn, I learn perspectives from all different, all different angles and all different sides. And, you know, it's easy to get caught up in our own biases or prejudices or our own uh, perceptions of life. And somebody could come in one day and say, yeah, but you haven't thought about it this way. And then you hear them say what they're going to say. And you go, that makes sense you know mm -hmm. and uh and so that's how you grow and that's how you learn and that's how you mature and if you keep an open mind and you're willing to talk to anybody you know you never know you could have somebody coming in looking like a bum they might be a neurosurgeon who is out uh working in their yard that day <laughs> by the same token you could have somebody come in dressed to the nines 
that's broke, you know, mm. you never know. So you got to kind of give everybody, you know, treat them like an individual, be an open mind, learn, from, be willing to learn from them. And man, you know, life, you never know where life takes you then. Before I let you go, please share with me, how is your experience being hosted on The Guiding Voice? Oh, it's been great, man. I appreciate you having me here. These have been great questions. I've enjoyed it. You know, it's like, uh, it's always fun being a bartender. We're, we're all kind of attention freaks. So, you know, you're asking me about myself and I'm able to answer it and, and tell you about my book and everything else. No, man, this has been great. I'd recommend it to everybody. <laughs> Fabulous. And I simply loved our conversation. And thank you so much for adding value to this show through your insights. And thank you. I really appreciate you taking time and joining me today. And look forward to oh. seeing you again in future. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So it was pleasure talking to you, Alex. And the friends, that was our episode with Alex Bennett. And before we jump into the fun trivia section, we have a quick request. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast because subscribing keeps you updated on new episodes. And if you have enjoyed this conversation and found it useful, please share with at least three of your friends or colleagues would also like the guiding voice tgv so spread the knowledge and help others grow just like you and your support means a lot it helps us create more content for you and our growing community now so let's uh, learn together on this journey and uh, now it's the time for us to hop into the trivia segment today we had an excellent conversation about writing and especially from alex bartender turned writer slash author and I thought I would discuss something around writer's block. You know, the origin of the term writer's block was first introduced by psychoanalyst Edmund Burglar in his 1947 book, The Writer and the Psychoanalysis. And if we were to talk about famous sufferers, even renowned authors have experienced a writer's block. It is nothing new. And uh, to name a few, F. Scott Fitzgerald, author of The Great Gatsby, struggled with it as did Leo Tolstoy, who wrote War and Peace. And you know the famous solutions? Many authors have shared their strategies for overcoming writer's block. For instance, Ernest Hemingway advised stopping writing when you know what will happen next. So you always have a starting point. Likewise, if you are an author, and if you have already come across writer's block and if you know the solution, please share your solution as well with me. If you are watching it on YouTube, you can comment your solution directly there. Or if you have found this episode through audio platforms and social media, leave your comment there. I'm going to review it and cover it in future episodes. And that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and also for being part of awesome community. And friends, we would love to hear from you. So do not hesitate to share your ideas and feedback either through our social media or you can also reach out through email and let's create content that resonates with you. If you have any guest speaker suggestions also, you can reach out to me at theguidingvoiceforyou at dreadgmail.com. I'm your host Navin Samala, a lifelong learner and my goal is to have impactful conversations that improve not only your life but also your career. Stay connected as we journey together and until next time, Take care, stay inspired, and remember, the future holds great things because the best is yet to come. Goodbye for now. See you all in the next episode with another amazing guest. Take care.